we had lots of nice uh, uh, images of what we thought we were going to build, and uh, none of those got built. And this got built. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, about the size of the very first of the five. Uh, we kind of grew and then shrunk. Um, because we then moved on to the campus, the provost said to me in January 2008, he said, look, if you try and stay down there, you'll never get built. I'm pulling you back onto campus. I resisted. I thought that's a terrible idea because we wanted all these partners to be in the building working with us, private sector partners. And they're not going to do that out on the peninsula. They would do it where we were downtown. Uh, but he was right and I was wrong. So that's another lesson. Uh, the visionary, the people who think they're being visionary, sometimes are just wrong. Uh, you really have to learn to, uh, to accept uh, knowledge from uh, different quarters and adapt. It's all about adaptation in this whole process. So that's the, that's the building and the program. I want to start with the design process. This is something everybody who's uh, in the design profession here in the room knows. Um, but it was a shock to me that uh, when we started building SIRS, uh, I discovered that in typical building processes, which are illustrated on the left there, um, mechanical doesn't talk to electrical, doesn't talk to structural, doesn't talk to codes. And they all talk to the architect, uh, and who, who is the only one who talks to the client. This kind of weird process, how do you design a building if mechanical and electrical can't talk to each other? So uh, the, the so-called integrated design, IDP, which is now becoming standard practice, certainly part of the process here, um, is, is really critical, but it illustrates a general point that the, the way we've institutionalized the building of buildings has had serious consequences for our ability to do integrated sustainability design. Um, and so uh, making that shift is actually not easy when people have a particular way of doing business, they're paid in a particular way, the contracts are written in a particular way. You have to really change a lot of things to, to do real integrated design, instead of sort of pretend integrated design, which uh, sometimes happens, unfortunately. And it's even, of course, more complicated, because it isn't just a matter of uh, the design consultants. There's a lot of people. If you want to do a very different kind of building, you've actually got to think about every one of these things, because you may have to do every one of them differently. And uh, it's a complex ecosystem. Uh, the process of designing and, and really here, uh, we're at the design stage still, right? The process of designing a uh, building involves a lot of players. Um, and uh, you need enthusiasm and willingness to, to change uh, and do things a little differently, to try out new ways of, of contracting and doing business together, and so on. But if you get that, you get this unbelievable energy. I can say the workshop I was at here in February or March, I can't remember what it was, there was that kind of energy in the room. And it's really powerful when people start to really work together towards a different vision. So that's where I want to go next, is the question of, uh, of the goals. Um, one of the things we're trying to, we tried to do with SIRS is change the narrative about sustainability. Sustainability uh, has been, uh, quite ironically, uh, has become a story of limits and constraints. It's about harm reduction and damage limitation. If you take the mythical average Waterloo citizen in the street and said to them, what is sustainability? What you would probably hear is something environmental. Right? That's what it means to people. Even though the term was coined, the term was coined in order to escape being seen as purely environmental. The term was coined in order to say it's the social and the economic and the environmental together. And yet it's defaulted back. And so for most people, sustainability means environmental sustainability. But in fact, uh, uh, it should be much broader than that. And the problem with the harm reduction and damage limitation agenda, there's many problems with it. One is it's not very motivating. It turns out people don't jump onto the bandwagon of cutting back and leap to the forefront of the social movement of sacrifice and doing their job. Who somehow has not motivated a mass uh, citizen movement in the direction of sustainability. It doesn't go far enough, secondly, because harm reduction, the logical endpoint of harm reduction is zero harm, so-called net zero. Well, who cares about net zero? We have to do a lot of remediation in the planet, both environmentally and socially. 
We have to go way beyond net zero. Um, it's just not good enough. It's also too, uh, there's a, a bunch of other problems as well. But basically it led us to think, maybe we should be thinking about sustainability in a different way. Uh, this was presage in the work of Braungart um, uh, and, and uh, McDonough on uh, the upcycle and cradle to cradle, where they started talking about, let's try to make things better, not just less bad. But their focus was mostly environmental, and we were interested in doing it with both human well-being and environmental well-being. Could we have a way of thinking about sustainability that goes from less bad to more good, that actually creates a positive outcomes from reducing damage to creating benefits, from sacrifice to contribution, from net zero to net positive. Every time you hear someone say, oh, net zero, we're going to really strive to get to net zero, I just find it kind of depressed. Like, come on, you got to do better than net zero. It's not good enough, net zero. Could we find forms of human activity that don't have to be minimized because they're damaging? but that actually simultaneously increase both human and well-being and environmental well-being. Notice the two characteristics there. It's both human and environmental. It's not the human in order to get to the environmental. They're, they're both independently values and ends in, in and of themselves, and it's about increasing. Now, there's often the answer is no. Harm reduction is the best you can do. It's not to say everything becomes regenerative, but what I would I argue is let's look first for net positive. Try that first. If we can't do it, we may have to default to harm reduction. But don't start with harm reduction. And that raises a bunch of questions. What what can be net positive? Can we have a net positive building? Well, I'm going to describe one to you. Um, can we have net positive industrial processes, transportation system? How about city? Could the city of Waterloo? be, through its ordinary operating procedures, be creating improved human and environmental well-being. Isn't that the kind of city we would all want to live in? A city that automatically did those things? The thing is, we don't know if that's possible, because we've spent so much of our time dealing with the mitigation and harm reduction agenda, we just don't know. This is the role the university can play, is a really serious look at where we can be that positive. Okay, so that's the kind of aspirational goal we started from, uh, and we turned that into three categories. We need an elevator talk. Uh, you know, sometimes people laugh at the idea of elevator talk. Elevator talk is completely crucial if you're trying to make change. You've got to be able to, you know, the civil servant gets in the elevator with the deputy, you know, you got like 10 seconds. Uh, or, you know, there's the private sector equivalent and so on. You've got to have the ability to, uh, to convey what you're saying quickly. So we had three terms. We said this building has to be green, and by green we meant net positive environmentally. It's got to be humane, and it's got to improve people's well-being. It's got to be smart. And by smart we meant uh, a continuous testing environment. Uh, however, smart later became to mean cost-effective. Because uh, gold-plated sustainability doesn't do anybody any good. Nobody else can do it. Uh, so cost-effective is a pretty important criteria. So that was the elevator talk. Those are the three things. And these three words we used over and over and over again uh, with many different audiences. Because one of the things we needed to do is create a sense that this was really happening. We turned those three goals, they don't get you very far in the design process, so we turned the three goals into 22 design goals, three categories of goals, I should say, into 22 design goals organized into eight, uh, in eight groupings. This is through a process of charrettes. We had a whole suite of these things, uh, one on, just on goals themselves, and then a bunch of charrettes on different components of the building. Um, and these were really powerful sessions where we had everybody kind of really brainstorming what, how do we interpret these, uh, these kinds of concepts. Our architect was Peter Busby, and he just pushed hard. Um, so we had some really strong support uh, from the design professionals. In the room. We then turned those 22 goals into strategies, and we ended up with 150 strategies. 
But this is a, a, a really intense process of saying, what does this actually mean on the ground, in this building, on this site? Of course, the site varies over time, but at, at any given moment we have a site. Uh, and so what does this mean? Uh, and, and how would we take those, 20, those 22 goals and flesh them out in terms of actual design strategies? However, 151 is way too many. Nobody can grasp that. You have to go through that process because you've got to get down into the weeds. You have to figure out what it means on the ground. But we then aggregated back up to 10 principles. And this was the lighthouse. This, because we, we did a lot of interviewing of the design team after it was built, and we talked to a lot of the people involved in the process, and lots of students talking to lots of people, and what we kept hearing was, this is what people remember. This is what carried them through the process, was the 10 design principles. And I think Alberto, you can uh, reflect on that as well, right? That, that this would come up. And so there, there are there kind of code words for, for uh, a depth of analysis and understanding that uh, is created through the process. And we're now applying them. I'm an adjunct professor at Copenhagen Business School. Up on the right there is the, the new campus redevelopment program. It'd be about a one and a half billion dollar process of building new buildings and, and retrofitting the, the <coughs> campus. It's right in the center of Copenhagen. Uh, and we're, we're adopting exactly the same three goal categories and the same 10 design principles. We turn that into the same kind of more detailed analysis where we end up with uh, many categories of goals, 48 goals, not 22, uh, lots and lots of uh, strategies and targets, and then keyed all of that to DGMB. DGMB is the German uh, equivalent of me. Uh, or golden books. It's a it's a building rating, sustainable building rating system. The Danes have taken it and adapted it for Denmark. So that's the system that we're using there. We wanted to code. It's actually a very good system if you're interested in building rating systems. It's good to take a look at each of them. Okay, so just to say this is something that can be applied in other contexts, this kind of approach. So there was the their service, and that's what we wanted to do then was be net positive in both environmental and human terms. We wanted to be net positive in terms of energy, operational carbon, structural carbon, water quality, and net positive in terms of health, productivity, and happiness. Could we have a building that would actually give back environmentally and give back in human terms? That, those were the design goals, and I'll talk a little bit later about how we're, how we're doing them. Um, and then treat the whole thing as a continuous living lab, where everything in the building, the paint, the glazing, the furniture, the energy systems, uh, it's all research over the whole lifetime of the building. Everything is continuous research to try and improve uh, the quality of the, the building, because that's what universities can do. Right? That's the unique role we can play as living labs. No other institution in society uh, has the four characteristics we have that allow us to be living labs in this way and agents of change in the community. We're single owner occupiers of a very interesting scale of capital and urban neighborhood scale. Every city on the planet is struggling with sustainability at urban neighborhood scale. Our campuses are urban neighborhoods. We're single owners. It's actually more complex than that practice, but it's legally the case. We're a public institution, so we, we would accept a 15-year payback at UBC on capital investment that had academic purpose. Not too many private sector organizations can take a 15-year payback. We teach, we teach them do research. Those four things, no one else has. So we can turn our campus into a living world where every single operational decision made by the university is a sustainability decision. And everyone could have teaching and research attached to a difference to practice So that was the idea, but we didn't, at first we didn't have the whole campus, we just had a building. So let's turn the building into it. Okay, so let me just elaborate a little bit on that, on what this was intended to do. Let's get all, you know, if there's anywhere in the planet 
where um, we can use rainwater. I think Hoover is going to be better. Um, uh, UBC campus uses 4 billion liters of water a year, and 4 billion liters of rain falls on campus a year. None of which, until this building was built, is used. We have, what do we use? We use water from the city, right? That's what we use. And it comes in a single pipe system. What does that mean? That means it's all treated to potable because there's only one pipe. How much of it do we drink? 5%, 10%, 15%? We're massively over-treating water in the whole planet because this is, this is everywhere. We're treating to potable because of these single pipe systems. So uh, we said, well, we don't want to have any water from the city except as backup. Uh, let's slip off the rate. Uh, now, the rain is not potable, so there's certain issues, but I'll come back to that. I'll get all the water from the sky, right? then uh, treat all liquid waste on site. We have full surge treatment capability in the surge building. Uh, and uh, so the idea is that the water leaving the building is cleaner than the rain. That's not possible. Okay. Water quality. Even a little bit of water quantity, because we our sewage treatment plant is 10,000 liters a day, and we only produce about 2,500. So we can import sewage from other buildings. That's what we do. So we see the sewage treatment um, Then, uh, uh, in terms of heating and cooling, uh, <coughs> instead of buying it, let's get all of it from the ground to exchange ground source heat pumps, the neighbor, neighboring buildings, heat recovery, or from the sun. That was the idea. Um, not hard to do. Uh, and then we have the advantage in DC that our electricity is already almost all hydraulic. So this would be a different strategy in Alberta, right, than in DC. Your electricity strategy is entirely provincially dependent. Because it depends on the generation in your problem. Ontario, the biggest, one of the biggest public policy actions in the world to reduce emissions has been getting off coal uh, fired electricity in Ontario. Uh, it's, it's made the numbers look really good, but it's, it's a one time uh, change. And I don't think, anyway, uh, in BC, uh, using switching from natural gas to electricity is carbon positive, is a good thing from climate change point of view. In Alberta, be a bad thing. So, uh, we can be maybe net positive on energy and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the third, the fourth area is um, structural carbon. You don't hear as much about that. You hear about operational carbon, like burning fuels and the carbon emissions, right? Um, CO2 emissions. Uh, but, uh, we, we need to sequester a lot of carbon in the center. An entity has to sequester just an awful lot of carbon. Cities should see themselves as carbon sequestration engines. And the way you do that is with wood. If there's a province and a country in the planet that should be building with wood, where is it? It's Canada, right? We have a big forestry industry. And the, the big paradigm change in building technology, one of them in the last 20 years, cross-laminated timber. You can now build tall wood. It used to be four story limits. We're building, UBC is building an 18 story student residence out of wood right now. Uh, this is a game changer. And, and, and this sequesters carbon in the structure of the building. So, we're building. A building that actually makes things better environmentally, improves the local environment. What does that mean? That means that as adding a 60,000 square foot building to the UBC campus doesn't reduce the building's energy use. It reduces the university's energy use. UBC uses less energy by adding a building. That means less operational carbon, because operational carbon and energy are essentially the same thing. Um, and so on and so forth. So let me, let me go through, oh, I'm sorry, then study this. Students are uh, craving 
real world practical issues they can get their teeth into. They have to crave it uh, because it's a whole different world up there now in terms of occupations. So practical experience is way more necessary. But they crave it also because it's just really cool and interesting to do. We find that this is very popular with, uh, with our students, these, these kinds of projects. Um, maybe we can get testimony from Sophie, but maybe that's the case. All right, let me, let me just show you, because I, I can't resist showing you the energy balance idea. So this is SERS, that's us over on the right. And uh, our brilliant mechanical engineering and ingenious Blair McCary, uh, who at the time was with Stantec, uh, said, well, wait a minute, I know, you're next door to the Earth Motion Sciences, aren't you? I know that building, that's a lab building. Lab building, what does that mean? That means few hoods. What's a few hoods mean? 10 air changes an hour. <laughs> that's the required minimum of air change an hour. So the whole, all the heated air, 10 times an hour is exhausted into the atmosphere, right? For safety reasons, because these are labs. So you've got to get rid of the fumes. Um, and then we have a steam plant, or we did um, have a steam plant, so there's a district energy system on campus. So here's the, here's the idea that we're thinking about. Uh, Earth Motion Sciences used 1,600 megawatt hours a year of steam from the steam plant. That's what for their people. Um, 990 goes through the roof because of the fuel mass. Think of all the lab buildings and all the universities around the world, not just universities, even. they're all these lab uh, So let's take it to CERT. That we only need 300 because we're doing all this demand side stuff. The first law of sustainable buildings, do demand first, right? Like that's the key start on the demand side before you ever start thinking about supply. Uh, we only need 300. So we'll give them back 600. Now, you see that 1600 up there? But that's what they used to be. But now we're getting 600 back. So they only need 1,000. That means natural gas burning from the steam plant goes down 860 megawatts. And carbon emissions down 150 tons. Now, how, how, how do we do all that? Well, it's an all electric building. Um, so, we've got power, we've got to move the heat around and back, we've got to run all the computers and the equipment and the lighting and the ground source heat pumps and so on. 585. So by adding a building, electricity use goes up 585. Natural gas use goes down 860. That's not possible. Now, this is the design. Um, you can see the wood. Uh, and uh, it turns out that when we, I'm just jumping ahead a little bit, uh, when we into when Sylvia so, so talked to a lot of people in the building and others talked to people in the building, the things they most liked about the building, in terms of the post occupancy evaluation, they liked, we know that. Air quality, we know that. Wood, we didn't know. We didn't expect it to be as important a factor as it was. It really affects how they feel about the building, their experience of the building. So, um, as I said, 600 tons of carbon sequestered in the building, which is more carbon we calculated than all the carbon emitted by all the construction equipment, building the building, and all the carbon emitted manufacturing everything in the building. That's pretty cool. That's kind of positive. It's structural carbon. Remember, how much attention they do it. It's a crucial issue. Uh, water systems already talked about. Um, Let's get 100% of the water from the rain. You've got to treat it on site so you collect it. 100,000 liter storage, because you've got to have seasonal storage to account for uh, the differential flow over, uh, over uh, the seasons. Uh, so you, you collect it, you store it, you treat it, you drink it, uh, you flush it, you treat it, and you uh, irrigate with it. And that water is cleaner than the rain. That's the idea. And, you, and the stormwater recharges the aquifer instead of eroding the cliffs. At UBC, we have 
uh, a clay right under subsurface clay. So the uh, stormwater basically uh, hits that clay and gets taken off to the cliff and erodes the cliffs. So you know this high tech uh, innovation is a well. We recharge the aquifer. Really, really. Okay, so that's all the environmental stuff. Uh, I want to say a few words about the human side. So remember, we're, we're trying to be net positive in both environmental and human terms. How do we do that? Well, the concept we came up with um, over a number of years was that in most buildings, people are office buildings, people are occupants. That's actually the term in the literature, the term we use to describe them, they're occupants. So we said an occupant is a passive recipient of building systems. These are people basically who uh, can maybe open their window, hopefully they can open their window often. Maybe there's some past lighting they have control over or lighting in their room. Um, uh, if they're in a, a large area, they may not have that, so they don't have task lighting. And that's it. Right? That's their total engagement with the building systems. They don't know how the building's heated and cooled. They don't even know where the controls are that they could use if they knew where they were because they're there, uh, but nobody told them. So they're, they're occupants, passive recipients of building systems. Could they instead be inhabitants of the building? Could they have a sense of place in and engagement with the building? Could there be a relationship with the building and with each other in the building? Uh, aimed at improving human well-being. So that was the concept. Uh, we thought what we would measure this would be in terms of health, productivity, and happiness. Or in, in a more academic environment, I would say subjective well-being. It's a legitimate term. Uh, but it's really happiness. To do all that, you've got to super monitor because you need to know whether you're succeeding. Um, so at the time, this was like uh, unusual. Nowadays, you can have 3,000 points of monitoring in this room for about 15 cents. So, you know, technology has really improved. We can monitor now. Sensing and monitoring is way cheaper and easier to do. However, there's a corresponding cost to that. We're in data smog. We're inundated with data we don't know how to use. We don't have the algorithms to interpret it. We don't understand it. And in fact, it's being ignored. So buildings are now producing massive swaths of data uh, that is, uh, if, if, if a lot of attention isn't paid to that interpretation of it, um, uh, there's, it's not doing any good. So super monitoring is easy now, uh, but it's more than just the technology. It's more than just the sensing technology. So what, what about BIM? Why has building integrated modeling really not been the big game chain, changer it was supposed to be? Why is it ignored or not really used or you know, pushed to the side? There's a really interesting institutional issues here about, uh, about building modeling systems and their integration into the operating system. Um, and I don't think, I mean, I, there's some good examples, but it, in general, we're not very good at this. Okay, so stepping back then, those, that, those are the design goals. And I'm going to talk about the performance in a minute. But before I do that, I want to talk about the, the lessons we learned. These are the five lessons we learned about the difficulty of doing this. And I, I emphasize this because uh, we often think these are technical problems. And if you have the money and you have the technology, then you just implement it and everything works. Well, it turns out it's not that simple. And the behavioral dimensions of this stuff are critical. And the institutional dimensions, the fundamental barriers to sustainability, in my experience, are never technical, they're never economic, they're all behavioral and institutional. In fact, mostly institutional. So, uh, the first one is path dependence. Uh, we do things a certain way, and we default back to that. The needle falls back into the groove, and we train my age. Um, uh, the needle falls back into the groove. Gravity brings it back. And so you say, we want to dig a new groove. So you move the needle, and then you go off here, and it's back in the groove. Uh, it's a real problem path dependence. Job descriptions, performance evaluation criteria, all these ways we operate uh, have a path to them. 
And it, if you want to change that, you've got to really put a lot of effort into those that level of engagement. Because policy is great. It's good to have uh, good policy. But if you don't change the job descriptions, the performance evaluation criteria, the codes of practice, the regulatory requirements, uh, the professional standards, if you don't change that stuff, it just the needle falls back. Those are the crucial institutional changes that are required. So you've got to spend a lot of time thinking about the job descriptions of the design team and the, the developer and the funders and so on, and how those constrain what you do. And that comes out big time in the next one. Plate spinning. I discovered there were nine offices at UBC that had full or par partial veto power over the SERS bill. None of them could make SERS happen. That wasn't their job, and they couldn't do it anyway. Every one of them could stop us in their tracks. In their tracks. So I had to visit those nine. We all had to visit those nine frequently enough to get the plate of spin on the top of the stick. Because if the plate falls off the stick, you're screwed. Right? So plate spin is a huge skill. You've got to get there in time before some bad decision gets made uh, by some office you didn't even know existed a year ago. And boy, they can just kill you. Um, Rick Wang. Every time you go to that office, and every time you have a meeting with partners and especially funders, you got to show progress. The world hates stasis. You can't go there and say, oh well, we're still working on it. you got to go there and say, hey, this cool new thing just happened. You know, you know, keep laying bricks, build the wall. Really important to show a sense of, that people get the sense, oh, this is, this is really happening. It's unfolding. So have news all the time to show. Uh, Mosaic. All these partners that you're trying to coordinate all have their own world. You've got to be the ground in the Mosaic, making those connections all the time uh, between these partners with quite different uh, roles. And then in the university, we have the wallflower problem. You know, we're really good at standing back and criticizing. You know, our two skills are giving lectures to captive audiences and then engaging in intellectual warfare with their colleagues. That's a great thing. So uh, engagement is not like a, especially social engagement, um, is not sort of a very prevalent in the academy. So how do you get people off the wall and get them to join the dance? Right? That's, that's what you need. And academics hate joining. In fact, I have a friend in, in Gothenburg who is vice president of sustainability who stepped down. And he, he trains staff in how to get faculty involved. And, and, and what you do is you go and you say, uh, Professor Smith, um, uh, what, what is it that you do? <laughs> and a lot of about what you do. So you, you make them happy, they tell you all that. And then you say, and does that have anything to do with sustainability? To which 85% of the time the answer is anything to do with it. It's crucial for sustainability to understand how I work. So you're just amazed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, stepping back, what did, what did we learn? Um, institutional design, as I tried to say, these are crucial. What are the rules of the game that all your partners have to work with? Because they do. They have to go back to their own institution and they're, they're going to be judged according to criteria in that environment. It's worth spending time really thinking about that and really trying to figure out how you can help them do their job better by working with you. Uh, and then all those five metaphors that I mentioned, it's all about engagement. This takes a lot of effort and time. You need champions who are going to put their nights and weekends into this for a decade. You know, like it's, there isn't another way, I, I, I don't think. It just takes a lot of effort and time. So be prepared. And, or, or better still, don't be prepared, uh, uh, because then you might not do it, uh, but just fall into it. Um, and then uh, the good news, the good news, there's a huge demand. This is really exciting for people to be involved in something. I, I can't tell you how many people told me, you know, in my career, I was just sort of plodding along, and this has given me, this has made me excited about my job and about the possibilities. This net positive thing is really powerful for people. So if you can get them engaged, they, they, people want to do this stuff. Who doesn't want to do this stuff? They just don't feel they have the opportunity. They don't see a way forward. They think they're too small uh, to make a difference. So when you create this kind of momentum in this community, you're offering people an opportunity to do something that actually they, in my experience, they really want to do. 
Okay, now we're turning from all the rosy design to the actual performance. And, uh, you know, there's content warning label here. Uh, and, you know, uh, don't, uh, all the goals are good, but be prepared uh, for surprise. Uh, this is where the building become, itself becomes a research instrument. So first we'll talk about cost. This is work uh, a PhD student of mine, Stefan Story did. Um, but if you look at electric building, it's roughly the same capital cost. Uh, so there's the 11 of them, and that, the dotted line is one standard deviation. There's CERT. So we're within one standard deviation of uh, all these other buildings. Uh, by the way, these other buildings, I think there is one or two gold, but most of them are not. The silver, a few silvers, and a few registered, right? Is that fair? Yeah. So uh, these are not like forefront buildings, and we're in this, we're, we're statistically, I uh, have to be careful with the language here, uh, indistinguishable from these other 11 buildings. However, we're above the line. That's higher cost, right? So let's turn from cap. So the, the lesson here is you can do pretty ambitious stuff and stay within the envelope of very normal variability, right? However, uh, the more interesting question isn't capital cost, although this is what drives the whole system. You know, the biggest barrier to sustainability in the world at large is the capital operating split. It is a huge problem. The operating guys have no access to capital. Uh, and uh, the capital guys could care less about operating because uh, you can't do benefit transfer from operating to capital. So that's a huge barrier to really getting sustainability. So, the, but in principle, the more interesting question isn't the capital cost, it's the total cost of ownership over 25 years. So we, Stefan did the, this calculation as well. And you see that difference in the green? That's the difference from the previous chart from the regression line up to the green uh, dot, right? Uh, so that assumes this best practice lead goal is kind of on that line. Uh, so there's an extra capital cost, but it's offset in these calculations by uh, expected lower operating costs and capital renewal. Capital renewal, you don't hear about. You hear about uh, capital costs and, and operating costs. Capital renewal costs are the churn costs. So when somebody moves in the building, someone moves out of the building, you reconfigure and you change all that. And so that's like 25% of the total cost of ownership over 25 years. That's a huge cost and it's almost ignored uh, in, in discussions about building costs. So uh, we built a Lego building. The series is decomposable at a fairly deep level. So it's fairly easy to, to reconfigure it. The operating cost savings you see there are a projection and I would say are optimistic. But nevertheless, it looks like kind of a wash, right? On a total cost of ownership. But try to get a developer to be able to think of total cost of ownership because if you build and sell, unless you can get that return in the lease rates or in the sale price, uh, it doesn't do you any good to have a low you know, uh, total cost of ownership calculation. Okay, energy performance. So this is, uh, two years of, of uh, energy performance. This is a, sort of a typical office building in Vancouver, according to the NRCAN database, uh, sort of between 250 and 300 kilowatt hours a square meter a year. Here was our goal for CERS. Our original goal was 73 or something, but by the time we got through the design process, it was a little over 100, um, which would have been a 60% reduction from typical. And you can see what we got is a 50% reduction from typical. So this is a half full, half empty story, right? The 50% better than typical, that's good, but it's 25% worse than we expected. We got 50 instead of 40. That's the performance gap, right there, that 25%. Um, and if you look at it, I, I just put this slide up to remind me to say, you gotta make sure your sub metering is done well. Um, because uh, this is worth of another, well, these are some postdocs, but also one of my questions. Um, we did three buildings in UBC, very dense buildings, and one of them they have no sub meter at all, and the others it was not very good. So um, pay attention <laughs> to sub meter because it's only when you get down to these kinds of end uses that you can figure out what's going wrong or what's going right. So here's what was supposed to happen. Uh, remember that building next door, we were going to get heat from, we were going to get 900 megawatt hours of heat from them. 
and then we were going to give them back 600, and they would take 600, that's the new 600. And the total electricity was what used was supposed to be 585. Well, uh, it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, we didn't get 900, we got 129. <laughs> and just coincidentally, we gave them back 129, but they only received one. This is not the uh, plan, right? And I can tell you a whole story in a little to give you a chapter and verse on what went wrong, but uh, pay attention to, uh, well, look, I'll give you one lesson. This is a two building system. The contracts we had with our designers were boilerplate one building contracts. They weren't being paid to go and study the other building because we didn't think to change the contract language so they would be paid to go and study earth motion sciences. So they made some assumptions. Oh, 20 degrees C will be the temperature that heat is coming. Well, it was 16. Uh, that's a big change. Uh, and and then there's a bunch of other issues as well. Uh, so implementation, this is down to the nitty-gritty of what actually gets put in, on the roof. Uh, uh, it wasn't quite good money. But these are all fixable. Now, if this happened in the marketplace in a building, you would tend to turn off these systems that don't work. In a university, it's part of the research. So we have an argument for fixing and making it right and learning from it. And then, publishing. This was, a, you know, this was a huge battle to get my co-authors, uh, my Alberto, but uh, at least one of the others, to put the word failure in the title. <laughs> People hate publishing for failure. But I thought it was really important. This was a failure. It was not a horrible failure. We were still at 50%, at, at not 40. Um, but it was a failure. And the lessons, this comes from Laura Fedora, her master's thesis, where she interviewed everybody involved and she crawled through and she discovered, I, I can't resist playing one little into the sensing devices. So she discovered that the actual reported energy was wrong. It didn't make sense. The energy balance didn't balance. We had bought monitors that measured the energy flow um, in the absolute value. Now, if all you had is a cube and a boiler, and all the heat goes only one direction, absolute value is fine. But if you have multiple sources of energy uh, from multiple different directions, the absolute value is meaningless. It's actually literally meaningless. It tells you nothing about the energy flow. So we bought all of our sensors because nobody thought to change that little teeny piece of the purchasing contract to make sure that they measured the direction of flow, not just the total volume of uh, a flow. So, another little example. And you'll find all of it in this paper. <laughs> uh, and more of it in her thesis. So that's what we can do. We can study this stuff. This is another student of mine, Anna Marika, who went out to the literature and said, why is there a performance gap? And she reviewed a ton of literature, and she came up with this nice little chart, sort of summarizing the main reasons. And she said, which one is applied and serves? Well, actually, quite a few. Too bad we didn't have this analysis before the uh, leave. But again, you guys are welcome <laughs> to take a look at this and, and, and really try to, to learn from your mistakes. I want to say a word about the building life cycle. Remember, uh, this is the kind of standard process, right? You design it, you build it, you commission it, and you operate it. And we can get better in all of those areas. I've talked already about integrated design up there. Uh, there's lean and green construction, we can do uh, lots of things with commissioning, uh, and we can do continuous optimization, which is kind of a joke because what it really means is less discontinuous optimization. We just do it a little more frequently. Um, but it's better, you know, less discontinuous is better. Um, but actually, what you need to do, according to Laura, is more like this. This is hard. You've got to have, I think, in the pre-design stage, you gotta have the operators or proxies of the operators in the room, and you gotta have proxies for the inhabitants in the room. Right? At that very early stage. The burn rate of consultant fees goes up if you try to do this kind of thing. They're gonna, the upfront cost goes up. The goal is to the total cost goes down because you're saving on the back end because you don't make the mistakes. But this I think is where we should be going. 
Okay, water. Oh, water is a whole story. Um, over a year, just to get the permits. It's like a nightmare to get you know, sewage treatment permits in a building. Um, and then a huge issue with the operating uh, staff of the university. Uh, I think things are happening now. We're on the verge. Okay, 2011, the building opened, right? Five years it's taken us to try and fix this water system. But once we fix it, it'll be so cool. <laughs> Uh, the, the carbon sequestration is kind of there because it's in the structure, right? So nothing can go wrong, right? Oh, but they added a basement to store other stuff, nothing to do with us. Concrete. So much for the carbon balance. It depends, though, what coefficient you use. Do you just use the carbon that's in the wood itself? Or do you say, what about all the carbon that isn't emitted because you're not using steel and flax uh, or steel and concrete? So if we can do the latter, then we're still net positive. <laughs> okay, I've said all this, so I won't uh, I won't uh, go on about it. But uh, boy, lots of learning. Let me turn to what goes on inside the building. This was one of the coolest findings. A bunch of students, a uh, head of psychology, got his office in the building. We're studying recycling. They found out that recycling behavior in the CERN is way better than in the student union building with the same facilities. And it turned out it wasn't knowledge. If we get 2,000 students a day, by the way, in the building, because there's a big classroom there, there wasn't knowledge difference. There wasn't attitudinal difference. And it wasn't a value difference. So that whole kind of information deficit model that, you know, give people information, they'll change your behavior, wasn't supported here. What it seemed to be is they were aware they were in a highly sustainable building and they changed behavior. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not knowledge, not values, not attitudes. Like, very cool. Um, but it's very positive. We found this in the Olympic Village, too, uh, in Vancouver. Uh, a, a, a very controversial development. People love it. And the point of that, of, of this, is the, the social is carrying the environmental. The social is working. The environmental isn't yet. We're going to be able to fix the environment because the social is working. Olympic Village is selling. People want to be there so they can, they can afford to fix some of the environmental things. We've had it backwards. We've been doing sustainability through the environmental door first. No, no, no. Go through the human well-being door first. Bring the environment along. It changes, I think, the game. Okay. Um, this is something very cool from Sylvia's thesis to the difference between the, the official story, this is the story we told, and the lived story of the people in the buildings. And they're not the same. They're, there's overlap. There's definitely overlap, but they're not the same. This is what Sylvia calls the qualitative performance gap. It's not just about environmental stuff, it's also about how people live. And is there a, is there a gap between expectation and reality? I would actually argue this is different than the quantitative performance gap, the environmental performance gap, because with the environmental one, you want to eliminate the gap. Here, you don't necessarily. You want these two stories to intertwine. This is what we call the interact. You want the building and the inhabitants to be engaged in a dance, in a conversation with each other, back and forth, learning from each other, and, and coming to some kind of uh, resolution. Okay, I'm ending. I'm getting to the Three overall lessons. Now, these are the big takeaways for me. Net positive. That's a way more powerful story. And it's something you can really pin your, your ambitions on. By studying both human and environmental. This isn't just about human, this is about people as well. Number two, IDP is great, integrated design, we want to do that, absolutely, but let's think about the whole building life cycle and try and take a much more integrated approach to that. Uh, and then three, as I just said, don't start with the environmental. Remember I said how sustainability, if you ask somebody, they'll give you an environmental answer. Really push the human well-being side. Designers are more interested because you're trained as designers in more in human terms than environmental terms. And the clients are definitely more interested. Uh, the environmental is often seen as a penalty. But the human brings the environmental along. Think of air quality. Think of um, uh, ventilation and so on and so forth. So, 
back to learning to do it. Let's do it learn. Uh, and I really want to thank the five grad students I've had working in the service building without which my talk would have been about three minutes long. <laughs> so they get the credit. Uh, and I encourage you to go over your thesis.
you see people standing there, and they're just like, <laughs> and then, oh, forget it. And so we spent a lot of time studying Zion and, and, and testing Zion. We adopted now across the whole campus a completely consistent set of signage. And Metro Vancouver is now uh, saying they want to adopt it across the whole of Metro. Um, once you do that, the, the burden of educating people drops because it's intuitive and it's clear. Um, and so you're, you're less concerned of, of you know, making sure they, they, they understand. Um, another factor here is uh, social practice. Um, watch a table. I wonder if you've ever done this, uh, this experiment. Watch a, a, a group of people at a table in a cafeteria and they all get up to leave. And the first person goes up and recycles everything properly. Odds are everybody else will do the same. The first person gets up and throws it all in the garbage. Uh, many people uh, will throw it all in the garbage. Ask them an hour later which they did. They only remember. A lot of human behavior is unconscious and collective. And so uh, it's, it's not all about educating people and telling them what to do, as if it's all conscious, individual, cognitive choices. Uh, sometimes it's about changing the practices, which again can be enabled by the affordances of the building. So I think the distinction between the two gets a little eroded.